Hi there, folks. Welcome back to our WP Tonic Roundtable show. It's episode 231. Yes, we're getting there. Getting almost to midway of 300. Um, I've got a, a really great panel, a compact one, but a great panel. Um, I'm going to let Jackie introduce herself first. Off you go, Jackie. I'm Jackie D'Elia. I am a front-end developer in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I've been doing more specializations in web animations lately, so that's been a focus this year, and I'm also the host of Rethink.fm. Yeah, great podcast. I also listened to your interview with Lee Jackson, another panelist. Unfortunately, can't join us today. Um, a great interview, Jackie. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm going to let Sally introduce herself. Um, like. I'm Sally Getch, the WP fangirl, and uh, I'm a WordPress uh, junkie. Uh, I organize the East Bay WordPress meetup, and I make my living building WordPress websites for small businesses and nonprofits. And I have a cat who cannot ever get enough attention. Uh, yes, you can see it on the YouTube part of the show, folks. Um, if you go to her channel, you'll be able to it's, see that. It's the, it's the bonus if you watch it. It's the, the video. bonus, especially if you're a cat lover. Uh, Morton, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Morton. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I make courses about front-end web development and WordPress and things, and uh, I have opinions. That, that, that's the main qualification for being yeah. on this show. It, you don't have to have knowledge or experience, just opinions. No, just opinions. Well, it's a bit difficult to have a show if you get people to get their opinions, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, it is very boring if everybody just sits there and says, I agree, I agree, I agree. I agree with what you just said. Yeah. I yeah. do. I love it when they do, but you know, in a way, it's not the best for the show. And I, you know, so there we okay, go. Okay, I'm just going to disagree with everything today. Then, yeah, just, well, right. there you yeah, go. There we go. Um, let's go on to our new section, folks. Um, selected three stories. I've mean, probably only hit two knowing us, um, but let's go for story one, which is from the tavern. WordPress abandons React due to patent clause. Gutenberg is rewritten with different library. Who wants to jump in on that one to start off with? Uh, well, you know, people were talking about this a lot at the uh, uh, WordCamp Sacramento last week because it had more or less just been announced. And a lot of what people said was, you know, this is probably a blessing in disguise. It gives them more time to kind of work things out. And there is a lot to be worked out. Uh, and I don't know... You know, that, that I think is most of those issues are independent of what framework they're using to, to build it in terms of, you know, just deciding what it is they have to build. Um, you know, I am terrible at all forms of, of JavaScript. I think, uh, given the patent situation, you know, it's, it's the right decision if, if WordPress wants to continue to uphold these principles of the, uh, of the GPL. And, uh, you know, now people get to duke it out about what they replace it with. Uh, well, they're talking about this. I don't know how to pronounce. How do you pronounce it? Panel V U E. I yeah. presume view. 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 Have even heard of it? Uh, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been delving in React. Uh, I've actually been going through a little course, and so I'm a little bit peeved. But never I'm mind. It's a new shit, man. Pardon? React is old hat. Is it? <laughs> Why? You, mean, you, mean he's not, you know, I, I did go to a presentation at WordCamp about, you know, the, the, the benefits of vanilla JavaScript, uh, sort of like the, the, the importance of learning just JavaScript before you start <laughs> playing around with this library and that library and the other library and, you know, what's going to be flavor of the month next week. Um, yeah, I'll Morton that. has a good course on that that I remember watching. Just I'd this better year. go watch that. In yes, my it was very, time. very good. It was I, very I, good. I, I it didn't do any frameworks. It was just basic stuff. It really was a good course. There go. Thank you. Thank you. So, what what do you think of it, Morton? Uh, the it's the right decision. Uh, this decision should have been made in April. Uh, the the fact that the team was using React, uh, the decision to use React was not a decision that was made based on, you know, what is the best framework to do this? The decision was made based on the current people who are working on this, what is the framework they already know? Um, and uh, 
it, it's part of a bigger systemic issue with how Gutenberg has been handled from the get-go is that it started out as a prototype very early on, which in, as far as I'm concerned is backwards. You should never start with the prototype, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, so they started with the oh, prototype. Oh, let's do, let's, ha let's have a round table about prototyping. Yeah, absolutely. But not today, because that no, will take up not the whole today. day. <laughs> uh, the, so it started with the prototype, and the prototype was built with uh, React because that's what a lot of the contributors knew already. Um, and up at the onset, people were asking, why is this done in React? And that was the answer. It was just because we already know it. And, and they kept saying, this is just a prototype. This is not what's going to end up being the final code. And then some people were saying, actually, whatever you do will end up being the thing that gets shipped because this is WordPress. This process is backwards. This is not going to be, a, now that we have it working, we're going to rewrite the whole damn thing. And then as things moved along, people kept saying, at some point, we need to abandon React here because React is Facebook and Facebook has an insanely, like, an insanely un-open source license. And Facebook is known for changing their licenses without telling anyone. Like Facebook used to have a REST API for their likes and shares. They just turned it off one day without actually telling anyone and tanked every single website in the world that was using that feature. Because they don't just turn it off. They actually made it error out if you were still using it. Um, so yeah, the decision should have been made a long time ago. Uh, so far, the conversation has been pretty much split between people who want to use React and people who want to use Vue. And up until this decision was made, Everyone who said we should be using Vue instead has just been smacked down or ignored uh, by like, no, we're not doing it. No further conversation needs to be had about this. Um, and now that the decision has been made to abandon React, um, the, it seems like a lot of people want to move to Preact, which is this version of React that's not bound by the uh, Facebook license. But legal experts say that that's just stupid because Preact inherits the same license. So that doesn't solve anything. Um, and I think there's this very strong, um, th there's, a, there's a significant, what do you call it? Um, uh, like th there's a legacy debt already in the project and moving to something else that's different like Vue or like vanilla JS or like anything else. Um, requires a lot of people redoing, uh, rethinking how they're doing things and training on a new library. And, and that's kind of where we're stuck now. So I hope this is the lesson that will be learned for, from the entire community, which is if you're going to do something, you need to have a serious conversation about what type of tooling you use up front and not just tool with, pick whatever is most available. Because anyone who's been involved with React for the last couple of years would have asked questions about why React was being used from day one, because React has been challenged over its license since it was released. Yeah. This is not new, so. Question, Morton. How long do you think it's going to take to rework Gutenberg for whatever framework they pick? So, interestingly, the way that they built Gutenberg is, so understand how this stuff works. So you have JavaScript, which is the language, then you have React or whatever framework, which is an abstraction language on top of that, that, and that makes it easier to do things like animations and hook data together and you don't have to do all this complicated stuff, right? So it's like jQuery on steroids. Um, and then what they've done, which is actually quite clever, is they've made it so that Gutenberg itself has an abstraction layer that connects to the framework. So in theory, swapping up framework shouldn't be that hard because Gutenberg kind of runs its own type of code and then there's this abstraction layer that talks to the framework. So you should just have to change the abstraction layer. Um, so Matt said he thinks it'll take two weeks and then uh, Jeff Atwood was like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> uh, I don't think- we, We've occasionally weeks. noticed Matt being a little on the mm, optimistic side. Yeah. I don't think it'll take two weeks, but I don't think that this is like uh, throwing a big stick into the wheels of Gutenberg. However, I do agree with what you said that uh, I think this is an opportunity for Gutenberg's team to pull the brakes really hard and say, ah, we need to rethink some of the things here. Because there are a lot of other issues with Gutenberg that are popping up now uh, that are problematic that also need to be dealt with. So I'm hoping that this will result in a bit of a walk back so that they have, they give themselves more time. From what I'm 
from what I'm seeing now, it does not sound like we'll see Gutenberg in core until the uh, like in core trunk until the end of the year. So we probably won't see WordPress for the uh, 5.0 until January, February, March. I honestly hope that it'll be pushed a long time into the future. Uh, uh, Justin Sainton said that he thinks we won't see Gutenberg until the summer. I would be absolutely fine with that because this thing is, the thing itself is not done. The thing, what, how people work with the thing has not even been begun yet. And the community at large is not aware of this project. So How is that going to affect the user base? I mean, so they roll out 5.0, and I mean, everybody's in my sphere has been talking about, is it going to drastically change how users interact? The people who publish content daily, right? Are, uh -huh. What is it going to do for them? And, you know, people that are supporting those clients, what are they going to have to be doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we had a, we had a, a contributor day where, where most of what we did was testing Gutenberg and, and, you know, submitting issues. And, you know, several people are like, so are my clients going to actually want to pay me to teach them how to use this new thing that's, that's being imposed on them? And it is kind of an issue. I know Kim and uh, Mendel are working on a sort of Gutenberg onboarding uh, for GoDaddy, but um I've also seen there's a plug-in to revert back to the old editors already, oh, yeah. so that... Um, Glutenberg-free? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I saw that and I was like, okay, so that, because there's going to be people that, who knows what the reasons are, but that, that may just not work for them. Oh, right. So it's, you know, it, there, there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff, you know, there are people who are going to have to, re, you know, dramatically rework the way their plugins function because of the meta boxes issue and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I think more time is, is better. Yeah. And that, you know, there need to be people thinking about introducing this and helping, helping well, to make They should the definitely better. have a toggle for it so that you can enable it or disable it if you're going to happen. It. No, yeah, no, no, I don't, not, I don't think that's going to happen. Gutenberg is not an editor overhaul. It's a WordPress overhaul. Yeah. Uh, the next iteration of Gutenberg will be in the, in the customizer. Eventually, everything in WordPress will be blocked. So uh, the, that, the notion that you can toggle Gutenberg off and go back to the old editor goes against the intent of Gutenberg, which, is, which just brings up like, another problem, which is Gutenberg should have started from the outside in not from the inside out, because it's confusing to people that it starts with editor and then moves out into the larger uh, space. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I would ask the listeners to go in and listen to a recent interview with Jake Goldman, the president and founder of 10Up, that I did a couple of weeks ago, or a week ago, time flies. And um, obviously he made it quite clear that he didn't have an inside... Um, information channel to Matt and what's going on. But obviously 10Up does contribute a lot of um, resources to Core and other things, WordPress. And he was talking about a time frame for Gutenberg um, for over a year, actually. He was talking about um, not in the first quarter of 2018. He was hinting that um, something in the summer of 2018 was more probably a realistic time frame, but he did emphasize that he didn't have, like I say, inside information. Um, so I found that interesting, really. It's, you have to remember, the idea of Gutenberg is from 2013. So, I remember that presentation that you yeah. quoted in your article. So uh, this has been something that's been burning in the back of Matt's mind for many years already. And he really, really, really wants to ship it. I mean, the original plan was that this was supposed to ship at the end of the summer this year. Mm. And the reason why it was shot down was because when that question was asked to the community, people were saying, uh, what now? I, I don't even understand how the thing works. What about my commercial plugin that 200 million people use that will just crash when you do this, right? So uh, there's, um, there has been a disconnect between Matt and the community. And it's only recently that he started engaging with the community. Like you saw on the tavern, 
they wrote an article and then all of a sudden Matt started actually talking to the community in the comments, which is the first time he's engaged with the community on this issue since he introduced Gutenberg in January. Uh, so, and once that conversation started, it became apparent that a lot of his intent had never been communicated properly. So people were just like, scrap, like coming up with their own ideas about why things were happening. A lot of the, uh, a lot of his conceptions about how people were receiving it were erroneous because he never actually engaged with anyone. So he didn't get the feedback he needed. So I think that that conversation in large part informed this decision to slow things down because once you see how much confusion not just a lot of people aren't like, I don't think everyone's against it I think a lot of people are just confused and the lack of communication causes mm. that confusion so yeah I, I totally agree with you there you know um like I had a really good I felt I had a really good conversation with Jake and he's one of the most I respect him for what he's done with 10 up and he's a very rational individual as rational as any of us can be um but what i was um i i totally agree with you morton i'm not against gutenberg at all um actually i i think as i've said previously uh, matt has a lot of hats to wear one of those hats is ceo and founder of automatic and they're in they're in a technological fight with some um, other players, and they that's the other thing that's really driving this as well. Um, you know, they're in a deaf competition with Squarespace and Wix and some other players, and they've got to respond pretty quick. You know, um, so he's got many hats, which is not attacking but the communication side was pretty grim i felt yeah. it has improved and it needs to improve a bit more um that that's what i was trying to point out myself what do you think jackie i was just going to say just going back to i forget a couple of months ago when they released the updated widget for the text widget right the the, the chaos that that caused for so many people because they were using the text Part of that widget to enter HTML and to do some unique things. Uh, maybe they were going to do some stuff with JavaScript with it, or maybe they were doing font awesome icons thrown in, and there was all kinds of ways. And then all of a sudden, they realize that if they go and edit that widget after they get this update, now all of a sudden their stuff just vanishes from the widget. It's gone. You, you don't. You, you switch back to the visual. You go back to the. It's gone. So, I don't think they. In that just that instance there, they took the time to figure out well, how people are using this. And if you look back, it would have been so much easier to just introduce a new visual widget that you could use and leave the existing widget the way it was. Mm -hmm. And instead, now they had to roll out a new like HTML widget. So now you've got to go and all these people got to go copy and their stuff from one to the other. And it was just a nightmare. So and I think that was a lot of it was just based on the lack of information at hand about who was using it and how they were using it. I think you just made a really great point. It's, you know, I don't want to over flag it, because, um, but it, was, it wasn't handled very well. It was, you know, it just wasn't handled very well, you know, and it affected a minority of people. Well, it was but, fine if you didn't touch the widget. The yeah. only problem, you, and, but, but a lot of clients were using these widgets to go update things or do things to, oh, and it to just wasn't me. clear to them that if they edit this widget that their stuff was going to vanish or parts of their content, uh, their HTML was well, going to vanish and, and from indeed, there. And indeed, why should they expect that to happen? And that yeah. prompted somebody to release an immediate widget uh, plug-in that was, you know, a classic widget for people to start to use. But that still meant you had to go and copy and paste. It was just a bunch of extra work. And to me, it all could have been saved if they just introduced the new widget as a new one and left the old one where it was and saved and everybody yes, all the I headaches. Should, I should think it would be fairly obvious without even doing, you know, intensive research that the text widget has been used as this catch-all. Here is where uh, I put yeah. all of those, you know, uh, embed codes from... <laughs> yep. You know, um, anyway, so okay. So yeah, yeah, okay. It's yeah. just so, an example of not knowing how people are using things and then just blindly making changes and yeah, it was throwing, right. throwing it out there. It was a great uh, to say we had a few. T I dealt with a few tickets around that subject. 
Would be a slight I, understatement. I, I did. Would, it be, a, would it be a slight understatement? I'm trying to forget it, actually, Jackie. But no, I understand why you're bringing it's it up. It's just a good example to think about. And that was a very small scale thing. Yeah. Yep. I think oh, we're going to go. I think we just, so, just one last thing. Yeah, go on. Go on. Whatever go on. framework that is finally chosen for Gutenberg will instruct the WordPress community on what framework is the WordPress framework. Um, and so this is a conversation that not only the WordPress community, but the wider web community needs to actually pay attention to because what might happen, which would be really cool if it did, is if WordPress adopts Vue. Because Vue is this up and coming framework that is not popularly supported by a lot of big enterprise. But if you look in the web community, you'll see that all the Illuminati of the web or the, all the, uh, uh, what are they called? Luminaries, not the Illuminati. <laughs> Same thing. Well, it's one way of putting it. The, all the luminaries of the web are embracing Vue because Vue allows, allows you to do very cool things very easily. Now, if WordPress adopts Vue, it means that Vue's um, adoption rate will go from you know, a reasonable level to, oh my God, there's like 20 million sites running it overnight. Uh, and all of a sudden, Vue's uh, position in the marketplace will explode. It will be enormous, which means people will shift to Vue and people start using Vue. So that means whatever framework is chosen by WordPress is the framework that WordPress developers will start using, whether or not they need to. So it's, it's not a trivial decision. Like it's been always been presented as, no, no, it's just for this one thing. No, it's a non-trivial decision. Well, and they're all, right. I mean, they're going to have to rewrite uh, Calypso uh, yep. and uh, other things. So yeah, once, once they've committed to it, then, then, you know, there's a lot of follow on it. You know, the only thing I've heard against Vue is, is that, you know, there's kind of a single point of failure in, in terms of, of development. But I think if it became more popular, people would get involved with the, with the project. Yeah. Uh, it's a nonsense argument. So, well, yes, I don't think... It's a nonsense I, argument, I, truly. I, Facebook is a single point of failure, too. And it's a much bigger one because we already know they keep messing with things all the time. Well, yes, that's, that's the thing is, you know, there, there's the theoretical and then there's the pretty much guaranteed given the, the past behavior of, of Facebook. Yeah, look, what does Dr. Phil say? You past past behavior is a good guideline for future behavior. So, all right. Um, I want to go on to story two because I think in some ways it does have some linkage. And it was strange because Sally, funny enough, Sally recommended it, but he, I actually chose this story five minutes before I opened our Slack channel, Sally, and I thought it was a good story as well. So great minds work together, Sally. I think um, so. There we go. Well, you're, I wouldn't say I've got a great mind, but there we go. And it's um, basically it's Perspective on WordPress by Scott Boninger. And um, I think Scott's one of the, I've always admired his development work and linking that to entrepreneurship. I've been trying to get Scott on the show for ages. Scott, if you're listening, please come on the show. I'm going to try and touch base with you again and get you for one of our interviews because I just think you're a fantastic developer. And he wrote a, a piece on his blog about going to an e-commerce um, conference and being a guest that WooCommerce was not mentioned hard ever in this conference, just wasn't mentioned. So would, would, would like any of the panel like to jump in on this, this blog post and what Scott is, was saying? Yes. I don't know if he was aghast, but, you know, he was surprised because if you spend all your time with WordPress people, you think everybody does everything in WordPress. And surprise, it's not true. Um, the thing that kind of struck me was that, you know, pe people were talking about Shopify uh, extensively and, and he's talking and saying, you know, but it's, you know, it's so easy. It makes, it makes things easy. And it's, you know, I had my major experience with Shopify was trying to do some pretty complex things with it. Uh, because the the client wanted to have like one set of prices for people who were members and, you know, another set. And, and Shopify was not really set up to do that. And, and it's sort of like, well, I think one of the big differences here is that if you're doing something simple with Shopify, it's easy to set up and you don't have to necessarily look at a lot of layers of complexity and, and so on. And, you know, if you're trying to do something more complicated it is it, not necessarily any easier you're you're 
may well have to find a developer. You're going to have to find a bunch of extensions or plugins or whatever Shopify calls them. Um, but with WooCommerce, you have to deal with the same level of complexity in the plugin, whether you're setting up a very simple store or doing something where you've got, well, here I'm going to do like, you know, subscriptions and memberships and virtual products and physical products and this and it, and, and that. So it's, you know, it, it's very powerful f for, you know, sophisticated use and for integration in your, in your overall website. But, you know, man, if you just want to sell like one or two products, uh, that's a heck of a lot of setup that you've got to, that you've got to go through. Yeah, it's, what what do you think, Morton? I feel like I've heard this conversation before. <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> this, this is, like, I'm I'm really glad that this article has gotten the traction. It did. Well, because uh, Scott, mate, you know, I, I don't want you, but I I, is, uh, I think Scott's work has been quite amazing. His ambition about his mobile you know, and what he's done in the past has been quite impressive, isn't it? Because this is, this is something that every one of us who has one foot inside the WordPress community and one foot outside has been screaming for years and just no one listens. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> ah. sort of, yeah. I'm just going to blast everyone's ears. Yeah. But you just have, yeah. the, there's a mute button, Martin. <laughs> I know, I forgot. <laughs> There are two parts to this. <clears throat> One is the WordPress bubble is way too tight. I, I, I've said this for a couple of years now that WordPress behaves as if it's an island isolated by massive oceans. It's not. It's like a country inside a continent. And we need to step outside those borders and get off the island more. Um, but the, uh, the other component of it, which is, has to do with the complexity of WordPress and also the realities of the actual marketplace that WordPress competes in is really important to understand because I, I, I'm a hundred percent. My experience is the same outside of the WordPress community. WooCommerce is not something that anyone considers because it's super complicated. And if you're going to go with super complicated, you go with Magento, <clears throat> right? Which is an enterprise level system. And then you hire an actual uh, e-commerce company and you do this stuff. So, and Shopify is an entry level solution that works for everyone. When people come to me and say, Hey, I want to make a, a e commerce solution with WordPress, I just say, Go use Shopify and they just make it look like your WordPress site and integrate it. And it works fine because there are all these pieces to e commerce that no one understands that they need to deal with until they actually deal with them. And when I say no one understands, I'm not saying it like Donald Trump, I'm saying like literally no one understands it until they have to deal with it which is, oh, so you're selling something online. How are you going to handle taxes, right? Like you're selling something inside the United States, but is it New York state has 197 different tax codes or something like that? It's super complicated. And paying a third party like Shopify to handle the complexity of that takes the load off you. Otherwise, you are pretty much guaranteed to run into issues down the road. And WooCommerce, for all its greatness in development and everything, is not a shoe in solution. WooCommerce is like, you want to make a button. I'm going to click on the button, a light turns on, right? And then you buy an Arduino and a soldering iron and a huge kit of all sorts of crap. And then you start soldering everything together and writing your own code. Meanwhile, your neighbor is like, I'm going to buy a light switch and a bulb and I just toggle a light on and off for the bulb, right? That's the difference. So we need to understand in our community that our tool is a tinker tool specifically for people like today, specifically for people who offer services to other people that allows you complete control and complete customization without tying you to a specific vendor. However, it is not a tool for just random person number four who just wants to sell t-shirts online for that. There are better tools. The first one is called Shopify. I could not agree more on that. Uh, you know, I ran an e-commerce business for 10 years and I did it on a hosted platform and I wouldn't advise anybody offhand to use WooCommerce to set up a store today unless they were really prepared to uh, 
devote the developer time to managing that. It's just, it, there's so many... There's so many dependencies on third-party plugins and free plugins, and then you're worrying about, does this one get out of sync with that one? It's just a giant moving mess, personally. I mean, I, and I've got clients who are using it, but it would not be my first choice. Well, what can I say about that? Um, basically, I, it's really quite difficult because Jackie and Morton are two to you know i really respect your views and you know you've run us you know a successful online business and malton you, you know a lot i just didn't totally agree with everything you were saying malton because mangento i've done some you know and what a freaking nightmare and uh, um shopify i've done some projects in shopify where the customer we went down a warren um basically of um adding third-party Shopify plugins and JavaScript's customization um, that worked in the end but wasn't too pretty. Um, um, scope creep, linked to our main topic of today. Uh, um, but, you know, um, so when people... I think, but on the other hand, I think also it's also linked to the way WooCommerce is sold. Because it's sold as free and it, there is nothing free about it because to get a function in shopping um you gotta sp spend a load of plugin money premier plugins to get the freaking thing to do what most clients want it to do and also they would probably be better off stopping with shopify if they wanted a, a, to test something out and for twenty nine dollars a month, they would have got that kind of function, a lot of that functionality thrown in. So I think that's one of the problems with WooCommerce, the way it's marketed. There's this free, but it isn't free, if you understand. No, well, if you're going to open a small, simple store, you're much better off using a hosted solution. I, I, you know, that doesn't require a lot of customization. I mean, if you need something very customized, then you're going to have to go with hiring developers anyway. So choose whatever the best solution is after you scope out what your needs are. But for a, for a basic store, um, if you're shipping physical goods, a hosted solution is, is much better. I mean, back when I did it, I used a Yahoo store platform because that was at the time, that was, was the, like the best thing to was. use for what I did. And it managed my shipping, my inventory, it did everything for me. And it was I didn't have to install plugins. I knew it all worked together. It had the payment processor built in. It was, I basically just set it up um, and spent most of my time writing content or designing the pages, right? So that was where most of my efforts went. I wasn't spending time trying to figure out how to wire up my checkout button or like just yesterday, I'm working in WooCommerce and you know, just trying have to go find a plug-in so that you can add the little shopping cart at the top with the number of items in it and all of it's just nothing is just standardized. You know, it's just like it's the Wild West. You just go grab something and drop in some code and see if it works. And, and I hope for the best. Just, and hope for the best. You can spend all way much too much time on that. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people trip up is thinking that it's going to be easy it is because certainly it's not, free. not why people launch stores in order to have to you know play around with the right with the software they just want to sell you have stuff. to spend a day working with payment processors and testing and linking and it, it, something's wrong with that whole picture it's just a little bit um but um and uh, hopefully aj morris will be joining one of the panels in the near future because he bought exchange from um and they did and they're doing some great development and it's going to be coming. You know, it's, it's been a while since I used Exchange, but I really did like the simplicity of their setup. Mm -hmm. They're sort of like, okay, here, press this big colorful button to tell us like what you're selling, what you're doing. And, you know, and, it, and if you're not using it, you don't have to see it. You don't have to wonder like, what the heck are all these settings about? And, you know, it was, it was very nice that way. And it just got, um, uh, you know that the, I think the timing of its launch uh, was against it, um, and it just didn't get enough attention. So we'll, you know, we'll see what AJ does with it. 
But uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it is a salutary experience for WordPress people to go to a non-WordPress event and see that like people out there are doing things without WordPress and it's possible and we shouldn't just like think everything is a nail because all we have is a hammer. I think that the interesting part about article was when he said, not only was WordPress not on stage, but no one talked about WordPress at all. It wasn't part of the conversation. That is noteworthy. Yeah. And that's something that happens every time you go outside of the community is that you'll find for the large part, WordPress is not part of the conversation. And then you have to ask, should WordPress be part of the conversation or not in this context? And why is it not? Is that because people don't understand what we're doing or is it because there's actually no room for WordPress in that conversation or what's going on? And I think there's some introspection that needs to happen at a community level around this, but it requires awareness that that actually happens. Yeah, I think you got, uh, yeah, you got a great point there. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Um, there's something, yeah, it's, maybe it's the way the WordPress was marketed to get, you know, substantial growth. You know, the core of it was marketed as free. And, but any kind of project that's got any, you know, <laughs> it isn't free. It's not free at all. Um, either, even if you're doing it all yourself, you know, you've got all the costs of doing it all yourself. If you can't afford to get somebody else to do it, you know, you're going to pay through your own sweat equity in learning all this stuff, uh, WordPress. That's a, that's a WordPress problem that again, that's been brought up many, many times and has never been addressed, which is this, we have to stop telling people WordPress is free and easy because it's neither. Right, and there's plenty of open source stuff out there where it, there's not really an assumption that it's that it's free. I mean, I remember, I forget where I heard it, but somebody was talking about, you know, uh, Red Hat Linux and you know, it's like, well, if there's this, you know, community version that I can download for free, why am I you know, why am I, and it's like, well, you're paying me these, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the ability to call me up and mm. get help, you know, when, right away when something goes wrong. Uh, so yeah, you know, open source does not have to mean free. And I think it's a reasonable expectation for a person who's uh, trying to make money that they will have to spend some money doing it. And, you know, it doesn't seem like people object to uh, paying the monthly fees to, to Shopify or the, you know, added uh, uh, transaction fees or, or what's like that, you know, any more than people particularly mind, you know, paying them for Eventbrite or something else like that, which just makes it easier for them to do what they need to do and, and concentrate on the, the exactly. thing they need to concentrate on. And part of the issue here is, is you know, WordPress trying to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. Uh, that, you know, is this entry-level, simple-to-use tool for, for people who want something very basic? Or is it, you know, a platform for, for building sophisticated solutions? And to try to be both of those at once is pretty darn difficult. So, yeah, it, it's kind of the like, well, who are we c competing with? You know, there was the, the whole thing of, uh, uh, you know, wanting to take on Tumblr with the, with the post formats. And, you know, I kind of liked the post formats, but the thing is Tumblr turned out not to actually be competition. So, <laughs> you know, and that goes back to like, we need more real data about, you know, both WordPress users and, and everybody else. Yeah. I, I think we could continue. It could be yes. a whole discussion point. I'm going to go for my break folks and we're coming back and we're going to be talking about which um, a great subject, how to deal with, uh, WordPress projects, if you're a designer, developer, or the client. And funny enough, Jackie um, touched this with some great insights with, a, with her interview with Lee Jackson, and I strongly advise you to go and listen to that interview, folks, because it was a great discussion. Um, and um, hopefully Morton will be able to stay on and Sally will be able to contribute and we'll have some insights about how to plan a project, which is a way linked to our news conversation in a way um we'll be back in a minute folks bye we're coming back when uh, um, i said bye i don't know why i did that folks but we're going to continue our <laughs> discussion um i had a brain fart there did i folks uh um 
So we're on our main discussion topic, um, how um, to do a complicated project. Well, any project the right way. Um, and I think you had some great insights in there, Jackie, with your interview with Lee Jackson about you. You don't have to do all this, but in the end, you're just going to pay at the end. You know, at some stage, it's going to have to be done right. And either you can the painless way at the beginning or the the more very more painful at the end. Would yes, it, you know, if 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 you uh, don't have time to do it right, what makes you think you have time to do it over? <laughs> so that's, great um, that's great would you like to kind of start it off Jackie maybe um, with some of the um, things that you said with um, Lee about this subject well simply put to me most problems with a project are all scope related it's either you haven't scoped the project properly or you don't understand what it is the client wants you haven't scoped the client properly or, you know, you haven't scoped what their needs are, right? Or understand what their needs are. So many of us jump into projects very quickly on the design and the build part. And uh, many well, of us that, get... That, that's the fun part, isn't it? Right. Or many of us get a PSD and says, okay, go build this. And then, you know, the questions that should be asked at that point is, you know, what are the functional requirements for this? And defining those and understanding those and spending the time up front Typically, clients are super excited in the beginning of the project, right? So that is the best time to collect as much information as you can and to get a really good understanding of what their needs are. So um, I tweeted out a couple of weeks ago something about, you know, it, you can build a fantastic widget, but if it's the wrong widget, it's not going to, you know, you failed, right? You haven't, you haven't done it properly. So during that honeymoon phase where everything's really good to gather all that information and to put it all together, that's the best time to do that instead of rushing in to doing the designing and the building part of the, the project and then having to go back later and realize that you didn't quite understand what they had asked for or your expe their expectations were different than yours. Um, and then you end up having to backpedal all the time or redo work again. So, uh, Scope is really important on there, like, and define and set expectations, right? So understand um, what the uh, timeline is for your project, what the expectations are, and to set goals up front with your client so you can remind them as you're going through this process what the goals are. It's, um, I try to do things in phases, right? So if we are working on a specific phase and we have a goal for that phase, like we need to launch this because you need to get orders or whatever, um, and then you get all of these other things that come up during this. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could do this or do that? You know, be really quick to move those on to a future phase and keep people focused on what the goal is. Does this, is this go going with our goal for this phase or is this against our goal? And then, you know, helping clients realize that as you go along. And then the other major thing is just communication in general, right? So it's really important to communicate with clients good, bad, ugly, whatever, and have status reports and check in with them. So don't go off and be gone for weeks building something and not, uh, and not check in and communicate with them. So those are some of the things that I've just learned in working on client projects. Um, anytime there's a problem in the middle of a project, it's usually scope related. It's usually you didn't understand it. You didn't ask the right questions in the beginning. Um, you you didn't define it properly, you didn't have an understanding of what it was that they wanted, or things changed during that, and you didn't have allowances in your whole overall plan of how to address changes as they come up. So, you know, that onboarding process in the beginning is really important and have some kind of formalized onboarding process where you can say, you know, this is how we're going to do this, this is how we're going to define this, and then if it isn't in there, right, something comes up later because things do change, you can go back and say, okay, we have a way to address this. This is how we're going to do it. And so that helps move that process along. Um, you're going to have bumps in a project regardless, but I think um, those are some of the ways to help it along. Oh, that's great, Jackie. Um, Moulton, what, did you, what do you think? It's all about planning. <laughs> all about planning and communication. Yeah. I, the, the more I work with complicated projects, the more I realized that uh, 
time spent up front doing research and planning and clearly documenting what's going to happen before any of the real work begins, the less risk there is down the road for scope creep and everything else. Um, when we take on projects, uh, we have this huge contract that we write up. And part of the contract is a multi-page brief that scopes out the entire project, what we are doing, in what order we're doing it, what is expected from the client at each point, what happens if uh, we go outside the scope of this thing, um, and <laughs> outlines not only the project itself, but optional elements. Uh, of the project and the cost of extending time or scope. Um, and we've done that because it actually puts the client at ease when they see, okay, so I understand that my, uh, my contractor knows what needs to be done here. Uh, I understand what's going to be done and when it's going to be done. And I know what parameters I'm working inside. And then we can go back to the contract anytime they say, oh, but we want this other thing that we didn't consider before. Uh, and then we can say, well, you know, now we're in this section of the contract that says this is out of scope work. So do you want to renegotiate the entire contract over this? Or do you want to, you know, add it on as an extra feature? Or how do you want to do this? Um, but that can only be done by doing extensive research upfront. So usually what we do is we'll take on the client for a couple of weeks to scope out exactly what needs to happen and do all the research, present them with a plan. And then say like, from here on, you actually have a choice. You can take our plan and go with us, or you can take our plan that you have purchased and take it to someone else. And then they can implement the same thing. Um, and it'll, you know, it'll be different, but it, at least they'll follow the same plan. Uh, so I think a lot of the time, scope creep has to do with not setting clear parameters for the project and not doing enough work upfront it's too easy to go right into Photoshop or right into a code editor. And that's the very last part of the project, you know, as a reference to uh, other conversations we had previously today. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Sally? I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this has been my experience and, you know, I have a contract that explains, okay, here's, here's this, you know, very detailed list of what we're, we're doing. And here's the statement that, you know, anything that is not on this list is, you know, out of scope and will be billed at hourly at, um, and, you know, it, <clears throat> sometimes getting the clients to like read this, right. They'll say like, oh yeah, let's go sign the bottom and not pay any attention to, to what's in it. And, and, you know, this is, is difficult, but yeah, when we had our, our round table about, you know, mistakes, uh, uh, most of my mistakes have, have been failures of scope. And, you know, I spent a, a long time, weeks and weeks uh, with a, a prospective uh, client uh, who wanted some, you know, events calendar customization. Well, you know, as I continued to talk to him, it, it was sort of like, okay, what are you really trying to build here? You know, what are, what are you aiming at? What are you, and, and it's sort of like, okay, so, you know, the thing you want, it's like, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're kept being like, oh, and, and, you know, I, I'd like it if, you know, if you had that sort of this feature that, that, you know, kind of works like it does in Airbnb. And it's like, yeah, you know how much Airbnb is paying for their, you know, <laughs> but it was sort of like, okay, the problem is, you know, you have a small budget of money that you've saved and you're trying to build something that is, you know, slick enough and, you know, sophisticated enough and easy enough to use, uh, you know, to compete with, you know, like the event brights of the world uh, because it was an events oriented thing. And it's not going to happen for that money. You know, what we could build you for your budget is not going to be something that can compete with what's already out there. And so, you know, you would, be, you would be spending a lot of money and, and not seeing the results from it. And I, you know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and so, you know, if I had just jumped into it, which in the past I sometimes have, we would have gotten to that point where, you know, the client had spent, you know, a bunch of money. We didn't have, we hadn't reached, you know, the goal they wanted. They were unhappy. I was unhappy. And, and so it, it really is, you know, I, I used to uh, 
share an apartment with a, a woman who's a professional organizer and, and uh, productivity coach. And she would give these talks where basically she said, you know, every hour that you spend planning spend saves, you know, four hours down the line in, in actually doing stuff. And, you know, in, on the one hand, it's frustrating to spend a, a lot of time, you know, sort of trying to scope something out and, you know, not really have any results. And on the other hand, I knew I had saved myself from a project from hell. Yeah, I think that's great insight. I just, oh, thanks for that, Sally. Um, another thing um, that I think you touched, Jackie, with your interview with Lee, which is really important, and I have been amiss, and I think a lot of developers, designers in the WordPress space um, is something lacking, is onboarding, having um, a quality onboarding um, system. And your onboarding system starts from the moment they um, get recommended to you or they go to your website. Um, would you like to touch that, Jackie, about uh, and how that saves you? Because I actually think you're better off working, having a, a side um, job or having some other form of income that enables you to stop having to take clients that are not suitable for you. Um, what, what's your feelings about all that? Yeah, uh, a lot of that I learned from Erin Flynn. Uh, she has some really good onboarding tools for, for creating a formalized process to uh, not only um, onboard the client once they've decided to work with you, but to gently onboard them into how you work and to seeing if you're a good fit in working together, right? So that helps clients decide if, I'm a good fit for them. And then the next part is, you know, you have another process that shows them how you're going to work together, where you outline everything and you set it all up. It Number one, it, it um, eliminates the, the issue where you forgot to tell them something because, you know, you, you, you thought, you know, you told the last client that, but you didn't mention it here or it wasn't in that email, where if you have everything documented in these onboarding documents. So if I get a, a, somebody that comes to me and is interested in working on a project, first thing I do is send them my, um, you know, onboarding packet for showing how I work, how I typically do projects, how I bill, you know, just typically what, what hours I work, things like that, just general stuff um, that covers that to see if we're a good fit for working together. And then you can schedule, you know, uh, an appointment to talk further about the project that they're interested in doing. So Erin was a big help uh, for me in just kind of honing in on those formalized processes. And it, it's like a welcome, you have a welcome packet and you have a, an intro packet, right? So your intro packet is what you send to people when you first um, make contact with them. And a welcome packet is once you've started working together, that really does outline everything. And it, it makes it really easy uh, to move that process along. So that would be what I would recommend you do is um, document what your processes are and how you work and put together those packets, whether you buy a template from somebody like Aaron Flynn or you work one up on your own. Formalize your process, though. I think that is, the big, is a big help. It also presents you in a very professional way for clients that they may be emailing other folks or reaching out to other folks, and they all of a sudden get this you know, intro packet to you and has all this detailed information about what you do and how you work and everything it gives you an edge up right off the bat. And if somebody's on a really limited budget, they may not, you know, that may not be a good fit for them. And you'll save yourself a bunch of time not chasing um, the wrong client. Yeah, I, I think you're so, uh, that's great advice, folks. Actually, I, I, like, I don't like dealing with people that haven't approached other developers or other companies, actually. Um, um, it, it, their their expectations can um, be a little bit um, inflated for their budgets, and it, because they've been talking to other people, they tend to start to be a bit more realistic. And when they see what's out there, um, the other thing I would comment before I go back to Morton is um, is that. It, after you, it doesn't have to be war and peace. What Jackie is saying, you, but you do need some onboarding materials. I really think, or a process, and it like what Jackie said, it does really um, um, make the client feel that you're more professional. But on, but on the other thing, the other thing you've got to decide is after you've provided this material and they've signed a contract. 
they start breaking the agreements almost straight away. You got to make a decision. Are you bailing out from this project? And are you giving your the money back to the client or whatever percentage that you know is clearly outlined in the contract? But I would strongly advise you that if there's clear signs that the client hasn't read anything and won't stick to agreement, even after you've had a kind of one-to-one personal conversation about this, that you're better off bailing out quicker than later because it ain't going to get any better. What do you think about that, Morton? The, I, I often tell meetup attendees and students that being a freelancer is not some sort of pinnacle of personal achievement that being a freelancer means you are basically spending the majority of your time doing all the work you don't want to do instead of doing the work you do want to do if you want to be a web designer or web developer your best place is in some sort of agency or in some sort of team where other people who want to deal with clients, who want to write contracts, who want to do all that stuff, does that stuff so you can do your design or development or whatever. Um, A lot of this stuff just has to do with the fact that if you come in as a developer or designer and you have to do all this client relations stuff, you don't have the experience to do any of that stuff. That requires, this is a profession. People go to school and learn this stuff. It takes time. It takes professionalism. It takes expertise that we don't have. So uh, it's, it's a question of what do you want to do? Do you want to be a customer service person or do you want to be a designer or developer? And you have to make that choice and then invest that time in it. So all this stuff just boils down to that. If you are going into a project thinking that you're going to be a developer that also handles a client, then something's going to go wrong. Just something's going to go wrong because that's you're not you're doing two completely different jobs, and one of them you're not as good at. Uh, And all the stuff we're talking about here, you can make onboarding documents, and you can make contracts, and you can make all this stuff. But at the end of the day, managing your client is a huge part of the job, and unless you're willing, able, and have the expertise to do that properly, you are going to run into issues. Now, it, it works. You're not going to collapse under it unless you let yourself. But there's value in not investing time and doing all these things. Bring someone else on board to handle it, and it will be much easier for everyone to get the job done. Work in teams. Don't. That's why I work on a team now. So, I mean, I do the same thing. I really like that part. I get to do the things that I like. Um, I'm not doing the things that I don't. And uh, you get to specialize a little bit more and have some more expertise and and use that there. So, I don't enjoy those aspects of it. So, for me, most of my work I do right now is with an agency and I'm on a team and I really enjoy that part of it. Most of the people I meet in the WordPress community and the web development community in general should work in a co- company, in an agency, in a team, or whatever. Uh, this this notion that working for yourself is somehow better because you're you don't have a boss and blah blah blah. It's nonsense. <laughs> working for yourself is an enormous amount of work. It's not what majority of people should be doing. There are people who are fantastic entrepreneurs who work best on their own, but that's not the default. That is the uh, off, like that's the, that's the little weird, uh, uh, what do you call it? Anomaly in the system. And the, this those whole, are the outliers. Yeah, yeah. and, and the, the notion that like, we, we've somehow in- Oh, you want to read the book from Malcolm McDowell? Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. 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 Yeah, Gladwell. it's- Gladwell. Uh, the, the, the creative community has gotten at its head that being a freelancer is the top of the heat. It's no. not. No. Just look at what's happening to all these industry experts. They all go work for big companies. That's not because they somehow failed as entrepreneurs. It's because they realized, I don't actually do what I want to do. I'm just managing people all the time. So. 
And that's what I do, folks. Uh, I've got a little team now. Um, I manage. I accept it. Um, um, I think Morton's given some great advice there. Just to finish off, um, you type it away, Morton. Yeah, hard. I got to use like super clickety clackety keyboard. Yeah, more moody, click Look at this one. Oh, oh, God. goodness. Oh, it that is looks, so fat. That Look looks that. like a relic. That's a beast. It cost me 50 bucks. And it sounds like the PS2 keyboard on the computer we had in 1996. Wow. Uh, yes, I, I remember that sound. Very it's awesome. Memories. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, um, we could continue, but I think we've just covered some. I think we've really had some great insights panel, and uh, I think we've given some real advice, hopefully, to our listeners. Um, listeners, if you um, please post on the website or email or Twitter, leave a comment on Twitter how you found this conversation. I think it, we provided some great value here. And, I, I, uh, I think we can sum this up as either, you know, get a job or hire a project manager. <laughs> with the budget allows, you know, but... <clears throat> I think you've got to understand what you're getting involved with and um and this kind of um your your what Malton, what I think we're trying to do here, panel, is that there is a certain culture of the remote worker that works four hours a day um and running their freelance business and that, that that's not a culture that's a fantasy no. <laughs> but i will say one thing on that point is if you do want to work that way specialize in something that is really needed so that you can be brought in to teams yeah. as a specialist to 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 uh, handle a specific task that needs to be done on a project right so you can still be a freelancer like that because you're not having to manage all those aspects of running a freelance business, right? You're just like an on-call expert. You're the cleaner that they call in when there's a problem and you command a higher rate and you you specialize and you know your stuff, right? You're really good at it and you can come in. Don't specialize in things that are not needed. I mean, you know, do your homework, find something you're passionate about that you really enjoy that is needed or that you see coming on the horizon, right? So, there's lots of things maybe in the next year or two that are going to be coming out for web development that are going to be needed. So if you're focusing and you're learning, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a believer in continuous learning because I'm an addict. I just am just doing it all the time. But those things can help you see what's coming ahead and what you can specialize in. So if that's your goal and that's what you want to do, specialize. The, probably the worst thing you can do as a freelancer is to be a generalist and just not really be uh, good at anything. You're going to be picking very low hanging fruit. You're going to you're going to be exhausted, tired, and uh, disillusioned in short order. Be a consultant. Uh, I, I tell my students that before they before they endeavor on some sort of personal freelancing thing, always go work for someone else for a couple of years to understand how the industry works, then be a freelancer. Because this is a profession. It's just like if you were an electrician, you wouldn't go like, okay, I'm done with the electrician school. I'm going to go out and wire houses. No one would hire you. <laughs> or if people hired you, I'd be questioning their... Uh, <laughs> judgment? Not be very, yeah, judgment. Thank you. It's, you should go work for someone else to learn it. And then you can figure out, do you want to work on your own as a consultant? Do you want to build a new team for yourself? Do you want to go work for some monster corporation? Like, what do you want to do? But get your sea legs first and then decide. Don't start right out of school or whatever and say, I'm going to start my own little business, just me. Because the overhead is going to kill you. Yep. Wise words. Well, then, folks, hopefully you got some value from this discussion. I'd be amazed if you didn't. If you could go to iTunes and leave us a review, that would really help the show. I say it, I say it regularly, but if you can, that would really, really, really help. And we'll see you next week where we'll have another round table, another great discussion. I just think it's been a fantastic discussion this Friday. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye. Bye. Bye.